Good evening, and thank you so much for tuning in. This is the Let's Live with Thurman Greco show on Channel 23, Educational Television in Woodstock, and soon to be the YouTube channel, Thurman Greco channel as well. Nice going. And um, we have a very, very interesting guest this evening because she is a writer. And you have written how many books? Well, I don't know. I think, it, uh, I think there's probably eight of them floating around. I, I brought five in the process here today, so but I think wow. there's eight. Yeah. So this is, this is something. I, I mean, all. you know, considering how long it takes to write your first one. So when somebody tells me they have eight or even four, then I know they've been at it. Well, I've been at it for a while. Yeah. Because <laughs> how long did the first one take? Well, the first one I did is, um, I, I, I'll show you the, this is called, this is, uh, this is what happens when you don't really know what you're doing, you start, <laughs> when you don't really know what you're doing. You start out with uh, um, a manuscript and you make it out of a Word document and it's uh, called The Midlands West of Ireland to the Round Out Docks. And um, I used this as a vehicle to put genealogy data in an interesting way where you might want to read about the people that are there. And I also used it as a vehicle to create stories about people that really are only in, um, alive now in genealogy data. So that's 1998. And so what happened is that now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm expanding my repertoire. Uh, and once I get done with this project about my dad, I create uh, fiction about people that lived in the 19th century in my family. And I take what little information that we can glean from census records or anecdotes or you know this different things, and then I use my imagination and I make a character out of them. And then that becomes a little bit more of a record of what the family, now you have to say what they might have been doing. You can't say what they were doing, because it's really fiction. But there's no other way of knowing that. There's nobody around to ask. There's nobody around to give you any kind of anecdotes or anything like that. So that's my next, my next neighborhood. Listen, let's Fun. take a minute to introduce yourself. We're just going off into the middle of this sure, and sure. let yeah. our let our well, guests know. Well, I'm I'm glad that you you're doing this show. It's fun to be able to get a uh, have a venue where writers can come and talk about the things that they're doing. I think that's important, especially at the level that I'm doing the writing. I'm doing it because I just love to do it, and, and I also am in that genre of uh, local history and family history and genealogy, and I I think they all go together. So. Um, Janine, as you know, Janine Fallon Mauer, and um, yeah, here I am. What what do you write on? A tablet, a a, a computer, a typewriter. What, what is your so the process is? I have the idea uh, rumbling around in my head for a while, and then I may jot down notes on paper. And then it becomes a manuscript kind of thing. I didn't want you to feel lonely about having your own manuscript now. So then I, I end up with it in a binder. Now this is one book and it's got four binders in four different phases. So you've been there, done that, right? Yeah. And so this is the last stage. I'm doing the last little bit of editing that needs to be done for it before I upload it into the, the uh, self-publishing system that I'm working with. So I might take these typewritten notes and then handwrite on them and then it goes back into another typewritten note. So I feel comfortable at a uh, keyboard. I feel like I'm very connected with a keyboard versus writing things down. So I'm keyboard oriented. Do you have is there do you have any rituals prior to actually typing it. In other words, um, I took a writing class from a woman in um, uh, the Albany area who had, when I took the class, had published 22 different books. Mm -hmm. And she, when she got ready to do a book, she would have like a little shoebox for every month for like a year. And every time that she, for example, 
this is March. Every time that something happened in March that she felt like would be appropriate for her book, she'd put it in the shoebox. And then we do this again in April. And then, and, and then she took the shoeboxes and started the story. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any? Well, now remember, I'm in nonfiction. Right. So uh, um, the first thing that has to be done when I write is I have to make a very good cup of tea. If Go, I don't girl. have a very good cup of tea in a nice china cup, then I'm feeling like something's missing. So these are things that'll percol it, it just all percolates around in my head. And then when it's ready to be gone from my head out onto the physical place, if you will, I just know and I just sit down and it just flows out. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so, so I think what I'm saying is I walk around with stories in my head for maybe, could be a decade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like this uh, project with my dad with his World War II memoir, I mean, that, that was walking around in my head for 20 years. And he'd write it and I'd type it and then I'd reread it and retype it. And, you know, we kind of did this little dance for 20 years with a story. But you got to have that cup of tea. Yeah. The, well, every writer has mm -hmm. something yeah. that they have to have. I think if I move into uh, fiction, then I might have to... I mean, and I'm not opposed to that, but I think it would uh, require a more of a process mm -hmm. to, to do fiction, I think. But, but right now it's nonfiction and it's a little bit different. You know, the, the data is all there and you're gonna make it into some kind of story, so. Do you ever use any um, props? I, you mean like a, uh, I tr like a muse prop or something like that? No, like if you find an old letter or a uh, yeah. piece of furniture or something. Yes. Do you ever do anything oh, yeah, like yeah. that? Yeah, I mean letters. Um, in in this uh, this one I did, uh, this is something that I did in 2007. It's so American Tapestry, The Mowers of Maple, Maple Lane, which, um, you know, these are for sale. This is a good local history book. I sell it um, pr privately. This book uh, came to be because of a lot of letters that were written by family members. And what do you do with letters? I mean, they're written in pencil, handwritten letters in pencil. So you do have to transcribe them some way. But I didn't use the letters completely. I used the letters to let the people speak. So the women that were writing, mother and daughter, were writing letters back and forth to each other. So in order to tell their story, I extracted that from their letters and then put it in, you know, time, time and place at the right time. So yeah, letters, yeah, definitely, yeah, sure. And newspaper clippings and obituaries. You know, an obituary, I may use, like in a project like this, uh, Round Out Docs, A Family Journey, I have an obituary or two in there and I just used it verbatim because it's, you know, back in the early 20th century, obituaries told a story. Now they're mm -hmm. starting to do that again, you know, uh, at the cost of like thousands of dollars to get it published. But, you know, in the early 20th century, you know, they could tell a good story in, in, a, in a paragraph. And so that becomes, it could become the uh, foundation for the story about the person. Sure. There is a uh, bookstore in Troy that encourages people to take that obituary and expand it and they will for I don't know X amount of money mm. will take what you give them and return it with a book that has a maximum of 25 pages. Wow that's a lot well so they cre they're creating a story out of the the obituary but yeah that's great I mean anything that you can do if you want to uh, keep keep the memory of the person alive, that's, that's one aspect of it, but also the idea of the history that's hidden in there. You know, you learn about uh, what people did, what life was like around, you know, it's, it's a lot of, you, you can glean a lot of information from obituaries, no doubt. So this is the first one. Yeah, I, that, that's sort of like the first thing that I jumped into. And then um, the, the American Tapestry, see we did this one because we wanted to celebrate the, uh, the Maurer family had um, 100 years of ownership of the property on Maple Lane 
in Woodstock. And we, I mean, there's a, a, an incredible amount of things that we found, found out about Woodstock by doing that. I mean, did you know that there was a creamery in Woodstock? The property where we run our flea market, there was a, it was called the Woodstock Elgin Creamery. So you, you get that information and you find it on a deed. So what do you do with that? You're like, well, what the, what's, a, what's a creamery? So you have to learn about that a little bit. And it, there was no records or no reference about that creamery anywhere. So it took a little while for me to create a story, but I did figure out that there were farmers in the Woodstock area that had milk to sell and they needed a place to process it. And four or five of them, very well-known names that you would all remember, uh, Van de Bogarts and, and uh, Schufelts and Risleys, they all built this building on the corner of Deanie's Alley and, and Maple Lane and had a creamery there and it, I think it lasted about two years. Really? <laughs> I don't know what happened. The bottom must have fell out of the, out of the market or something, but then that's the building that the Maurer family bought. But it took, it was an opportunity to write a little piece about Woodstock history uh, as far as you knew what the farmers were doing with their property. They weren't just growing hay. They were also had a, a whole milk and butter. And so, you know, those are the kind of things that you can, you can run into when you do that kind of research. I mean, I write books because I want people to learn about, uh, so these two books are not only local history, but they're world history because the Maurer family is of German descent, and I wanted to be able to learn just exactly why in 1710 did a family uproot themselves. What were the socioeconomic or what were the maybe the natural uh, elements of the, the weather? What happened back in 1710? So it took a little research to figure that out. I mean, you don't just wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to move, uh, you know, 10,000 miles away or whatever. Why did you do that? So I satisfied that question for myself, and it's there in a document that anybody can read. And where did the, when the Maurers came to this country, where did they land? Well, they, uh, you know, they came to up the Hudson River to Newburgh in a group. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a forced migration, if you will, uh, due to economic hardships and bad winters and uh, starvation and all these uh, terrible things that can happen to people. And they ended up in uh, East Camp and West Camp, which is right across the river. You know, there's this whole, what they call Palatine settlements. And that was the, the beginning of that, uh, of the journey of the family that finally ended up in Woodstock. And I did the same thing with this one. I mean, I needed to know uh, why did the, my Irish relatives, what was the story about why did they leave Ireland? So, and that was 100 years later than the, than the Mowers. And I was blessed to be able to learn a lot of world history by studying my family. So it's not just all that data that's floating around there on Ancestry.com or in, you know, some census record. There's real reasons why people make the decisions that they make. And, and I, I'm, I'm excited to say that I think I've satisfied my curiosity with a lot of this. And it's, it's there for uh, my family and anybody else that wants to take a look at it to, to do that. So it's fun. And it's fun to do. Do you, I assume you use genealogy records? Yes. I, I, um, I am fortunate, though, to be able to have had the blessing to know people that could tell me firsthand about the original people. So then I took that information and then verified it with census records. So, yeah, it's much better to talk to somebody about what's going on or what went on or what they remember. And, you know, we were very lucky to be able to do that with people. So. And then, and then you can turn it into a story about the community, your county, your state, however you want to put it into. But, but that, so that's what that's what participated in this in this one. These two, those Both of two, those. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, two different. Let's let's say that there are two different eras of American history. One is the 18th century, and one is the 19th century. Um, this one is more of the 20th century. This is the one, uh, um, this is available on Amazon, and it's a really fun title. He didn't want to work on the railroad. And then the second subtitle is High School Football Presents an Unexpected Opportunity. So this is really the story of my dad who grew up in Kingston. So the benefit of having this book to, to read is that a person will learn about Kingston, New York in the 
1920s, which is in the you know, beginning of the Depression era. And they're very, they're, my grandfather worked on the railroad in Kingston, so there's a, lot, you know, there's a lot of stories that are circulating here around the New York Central Railroad and where he lived, what kind of work he did, what the family situation was. They were poor before the Depression. I guess that's the best way, to, that's the simplest way to put that. But um, my dad was a high school football star. So there's a whole set of things that go on uh, when you have someone who's in um, a poorer family and he's now a football star. And then you have the people that are all people of means. Suddenly he's popular with a group of people that he wouldn't be popular with if he wasn't a football star. Right. So there's all that kind of you know, stuff that you can put in here. So this was my first. Um, now this was my second self-publishing on a on an internet kind of setup. So and it worked out pretty good. I'm not 100% happy with the product itself, but for doing it for the first time for myself, I, I was excited to be able to do it. But you know, I learned about uh, what was going on in Kingston during the pre depression. Uh, you know, what people were doing to to, to live. He he speaks about uh, in so he went to college in 1941 40. And he knew people at that time, uh, the World War II was just starting, that were, because they had no jobs, they were just joining the service. So they, those, this, that's a subset of people that became career military maybe, um, which, um, you know, he, he didn't become. But there's just, just all this information just keeps flowing out at you. It's just amazing. But did you know about this book? No. All right. This is my, this is my, uh, Janine took a, took a detour and went into an area where I wasn't really uh, familiar with writing, but I figured I'm going to do it because I was really moved to do it. So it's called Hummingbird in a Hurricane. This is also on uh, through Amazon, or you can buy it through me. Uh, it's a co-author book by me and my cousin, uh, Michelle Mellert. And it came about, this is kind of funny how this came about. So Shelley was journaling her journey with uh, cancer, melanoma skin cancer, on Facebook, right? Who knew, right? But she felt driven to have something to say every day. It was a, it was a beautiful spiritual journey that she was experiencing under some awful circumstances with going through treatment for cancer. And I just woke up one day and I was like, you know, this has got to be in a place where other people can see it besides just the, you know, hundred or so people that might be seeing it on social media. So I pitched the idea to her. I said, here's what we'll do. You'll write an introduction and I'll write an introduction. You'll write a conclusion. I'll write a conclusion. And in between all that, I'm going to take the three years that you've been posting on Facebook and distill them down into, you know, a reasonable amount of posts that show your journey, your spiritual journey of of understanding yourself much better while you're struggling with cancer treatments. And it's a lovely book. I gotta tell you though, it's hard to sell a book about cancer. There are a lot of books out there that are hard to sell. Well, cancer, I, 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 I have to tell you, I, I will give a, a good, very brief overview of what this book is about. And as soon as I mention the word cancer, right, they did all of a sudden it's it, like, Whoop. it just, <laughs> your it's just like gone. that. It, it's amazing. So, um, you know, and I get that. I, I, I wrote this when I was actually uh, employed in the oncology field. And there was a second reason for doing this. I, I called it a soul search for peace during cancer treatment. And that is exactly what Shelley writes about, and it's exactly what she was looking for, peace during this uh, awful experience of uh, the clinical trials that she was uh, being exposed to. And um, my brother at the same time was going through the same type of cancer, but not the same cancer, if that makes sense. Yes. And he was not having a good experience. So I was, I was the observer. This is what that why this book is important because so many people who have a loved one who has cancer you you don't know what to do for them you don't know how to help them you feel paralyzed you're watching them suffer you're watching them go through economic problems just the whole gamut of things and you pretty much are powerless over what you really it takes a lot to figure out how you can help them and so for me i had two people that i was very close to were 
experiencing cancer at the same time. And it helped me kind of put that in a perspective of, I almost had to go on the same kind of journey that Shelley was on, which was a spiritual journey to learn how to get into a different place to manage the emotions and the pain that everybody suffers when that disease of cancer comes upon people. So, so in the process of uh, writing this book, my brother died, and um, that was very hard for Shelley to, to know that you know he had an outcome that didn't have. She had a lot of hope. And he, his journey was not, it, he tried to have hope and he did everything that he could do, but it, it wasn't successful against the disease of melanoma skin cancer. She had, a, uh, the, the book ends with her being in remission. So she had a, a period of remission for a while. So it, it, that's why it's a happy book, I say. I say it's a hopeful book because she really writes uh, really well ab about her, her, um, uplifting journey to spiritual peace. Subsequently, she succumbed to another form of cancer a few years later, but, um, you know, in the, in the, you know, that's it. That's what happens in the cancer world. You get cured of one and something else wanders through and there you are. Yes. <laughs> but, so that's my, uh, that's my, my, my jump away from uh, writing about family and local history. And I, I really think it's a great, um, a great little book. And one of these days I'm going to figure out a sales pitch that wants to make people want to purchase it rather than have them be afraid of the word Listen, cancer, you know? I, I think <laughs> and there, if I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, I think there are a lot of categories of books out there uh, that, uh, and, and mm. disease, you know, cancer mm. being one, mm in which the writers are spending, will spend uh, months, years, a lifetime trying to figure out how to sell this mm. because people just don't, they are afraid of the disease, they're afraid of the book, yes. they're afraid yeah. of, you know. The word, yeah, yeah. it is true. And, and again, but I try, sort of, you know, if, if the, here's what happens, I guess, when the person needs, this is what Shelley would say, Yes, this is exactly what Shelley was saying. Thank you. So, when the person is ready for the information, they will come to it. That's exactly how Shelley would put it. So, my role is to have it available. And when the person who needs it, they will come to it. That's, that's sort of... Right, that's and, sort, yeah, and you know. also, you have to make it so that they know it's available. So right, right. and I'm, I'm like a typical, like many authors are, I don't do that very well. You know how, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a very good marketer. That's not certainly, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm not. I'm more interested in being the creative end of it. I need someone to market for me, I guess. There you go. Well, isn't I'm, that I'm, common? Isn't that common? With I, I, there are just a lot of books out there that do not get, they do not mm -hmm. get successfully marketed and uh, Isabel Allende says that writing a book is like putting a message in a bottle and throwing it into the ocean. And in the end, it'll get there where it's supposed to get there. And, and there is nothing wrong with realizing that you have written a book that people are not ready to read. I think that's the only way to look at it with something like that. You know, it's certainly, uh, I mean, I think the local history ones, if I marketed them a little bit better and let people know um, that I have them, it would be a different story. And that's, you know, when I get done writing, I'll go on to marketing, I guess, you know. But right now, uh, the spirit moves me to do these writing projects. I mean, this this one that's sitting here in, in bits and pieces of paper are, um, my dad my dad was a World War II uh, veteran, Marine, and he suffered what, you know, we're not doctors, but my brother and I, he had some form of PTSD, and we're also just brainstorming for ourselves that it was some form of uh, survivor guilt because he came home, and he was exhibiting some behaviors, you know, in the 1990s, and I said to him, look, you know, you need to go see a counselor. I'm not going to go see a counselor. Run the Marine. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. So I was sort of at my wit's end, and so the only thing I could think of was I said to him, why don't you just start writing it all down? Write whatever's bothering you, just write it, just get it out, it's killing you, for God's sakes, write it. So thankfully he listened to me and uh, he did start writing it, but what he did was he started from the, 
first day he was at boot camp. Oh. So, and he wrote it from the perspective of the story of what an individual experiences in boot camp, how your, your freedoms are taken away from you. You don't have the ability to decide when you're going to get up. You can't decide where you're going to eat or what you're going to eat. You're completely put into this regimented box and you have to do exactly what you're told. So he did a whole, I mean, the most of his project is, is about that. And then uh, he went on to Camp Pendleton to be trained to be a rifleman. So he was going to be in uh, the Pacific Theater and go and, you know, be booed on the ground and, you know, be all the, do all the killing that they like to do in wars. And uh, I, they don't like to do it, but that's what they do. So, but thankfully, he was uh, put into what's called uh, quartermaster transport quartermaster school. So he, I, I wrote in here, my brother and I are each writing little interludes and we're writing uh, our own personal perspective of what we saw. And I, and I wrote, whoever had the hand in putting that transport quartermaster school in front of him, they did my brother and I a favor because it pretty much saved his life. Right. Hence the survivor guilt. Because all the men that he became friends with and he trained with to be able to go into combat, they went into combat. He was, what he ended up doing was working as a, mu a munitions uh, carrier. Not, that's not the right word. He was the supply chain. He took the ammunition off the boat, put it on the beach, and then from the beach, the trucks would come and pick up the ammunition. So he was constantly loading trucks you need this, you need that, you need this, boom, 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 off you go. And then another truck would come in, boom, 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 off you go. He never told me that, I just made that all up. See, that's what you, that's what you, that's what, that's what you do now. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining what he did. He never really talked about it that way. It's crazy how it all works, right? So that's what he wrote about. So we're putting that together. It'll be a little book like this. It'll be available for sale. And I think it's gonna be very popular because it's a different kind of story. Uh, than the typical, uh, you know, we went and we got on the red beach and we took a hundred yards and we killed a thousand people and then we took another hundred yards and we killed another thousand people. He's talking about, you know, being on the back and, and hearing what went on and seeing what they experienced and the images of what the fighting men described and how it affected people. So I think it'll be a different perspective. So. But you know that's maybe very, I'll learn how to market when I get he, this one going. He had a very he had a very important job. Yes. Oh yeah. You know, you know because yeah. we're learning now with the Ukraine thing that that's one of the big it, problems it, it, that Putin has is getting yeah, you know yeah. getting the ammunition. If you there. don't have your ammunition, and and he did write a very good. Um, uh, he wrote one essay about if you can imagine you've come from mm -hmm. a cargo ship, you've come on a landing ship that brings you and the ammo in and you run up on the beach and you establish your ammo dump and as they're digging their foxholes, the enemy shells start coming in and they, they all got frozen in their foxhole. So they're, the, they're not really armed. They're not there to shoot back or do right. anything. And where he was, they didn't, another, I, the subtitle for this book is he was a lucky man. That's the subtitle. Where he was, they didn't get direct hits. But right over there, the guys in the foxhole got direct hits. So all of a sudden, his, his boss is up out of the foxhole. We've got to go help. And he's up, whoa, we got to go help. So off they went and you know pulled people out and all that. So even though they were in the back of all the fighting, he was, you know, he had a couple of experiences that were very life-threatening, if you will, yeah. you know, kind of thing. But uh, he had, it's funny, you should mention the goings on today. I, I kept this little uh, interlude open so that I could talk <coughs> about it. You know, part of what the purpose of putting this little book together about uh, my dad is that his being a Marine and going through that regimented <coughs> training directly affected my two brothers and I, it affected his relationship with our mother, you know, so they divorced. And so I kind of grew up saying, I grew up in a Marine household, even though he 
got out of the Marines, went to school, became a teacher, became a union organizer. That experience of going to boot camp and having military training never went away. No, never went away. So we had a funny, we had a saying, I used it in my nursing career a lot, you know, how nurses are. It, nursing isn't, isn't the military, but there are aspects of it that can be like the military where you, you have to plan how to do battle with whatever the illness is that you're doing battle with. Let's leave it like that. And sometimes as nurses, we would run into roadblocks. We'd either run into roadblocks with physicians or administration, or you run into a roadblock with family, or you run into a roadblock as a patient isn't hearing what you're saying. And I, myself and many nurses that are the same age group that I am, you could, we, you could see it. We just walk down the hall and we go, ours is not the reason. No, ours is not to reason why. Ours is just to do or die. Yeah. So in writing this, this is how you get on detours, right? So in writing this project, that saying is in my head. It's in my heart because it came from my parents. So I took the, I had to look it up. Well, where the heck did that come from? Because that's part of what I like to do. I, I like to know where, what's the origin of something. So I'll just give you the, the quick, so it's from a, do you know? Am I going to? No, use? this is fine. Okay, all right. So um, Tennyson wrote a poem, and the real phrase is, theirs is not to reason why. Theirs is but to do or die. So he's writing about someone else. So who is he writing about? You're, the name of the poem is The Charge of the Light Brigade. Many of you may know this already. This is brand new to me. And when was it written? 1854. And what is Tennyson writing about? He's writing about his response, his personal response, because this is a political poem, believe it or not, about sending British troops on a fool's mission against Russian troops during the Crimean War in 1854. Wow. So there's your current history mixed in with ancient history. <laughs> Wow. Right? Yeah. That's a whole nother story. But so this is going to be, um, this I'll have, I'll have this year at the flea market. So um, this will be You're my, going to have this this year? Oh, the, yeah. This is. That's like tomorrow yes, or something. Close. You yes. are that close. Yes, yes, yes. It's going to be uploaded and done, sister. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't get, I don't I get going to do that, but I'm going to do, yeah, no, you know, it's, I, it's ready. It is it's just, ready. I've, I've spent years saying, okay, I'm here. I'll have this thing done and finished in a month. Six months, nine months, 12 months. Oh, still God. Yeah, no, on this it. has to finish up because I got other things I want to get involved in. <laughs> I want to do more of that fictional writing about um, people. Uh, I think that's a, a good vehicle to, to work on. Um, I think it's a great way to remember people. I have, I have, a, I have a great uncle uh, that I was just... This is a fantastic little story. You talk about war stories. You know, when you do this kind of stuff, you, you learn about um, the, the different events that go on globally. And so this is a perfect little setup that's perfect. It's just, I can't wait to fictionalize it. But I, gotta, I can talk to this man's granddaughter, so she's going to be involved in it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call her up, and I'm going to say, Jane, here's what I think this little piece of information can, can become something bigger. In 1918, this is my great uncle, so it's my grandfather's brother, Ed. He was stationed at Fort Wadsworth and was preparing to go overseas. So this is what would happen. You would go into a little bit of training. Well, you know, Dad's was a year, but uh, I think World War I was different. He would go into a little training stateside, and then they put you on a boat, and you'd go, and you'd get thrown into this terrible war. So... He was preparing to go overseas, and he received news that his brother-in-law had died. So he is able to leave his station in the United States. He goes home for the funeral, 1918, World War I, and missed being shipped out. So, well, he's got to go back, and he's got to get ready to go across. What happens? He learned that the group that he was going to be going overseas with 
the whole unit got wiped out. So if he had been, if his brother-in-law hadn't died and he hadn't gone home for the funeral, he wouldn't be here or, you know, he wouldn't have lived to have a family and grow up and I wouldn't know my cousin because she wouldn't exist. So this is a story that begs to be fleshed out a little bit because how did he, what did he, I'm going to say, Jane, what did your grandfather say about that? And she's going to say, I don't know. And I'm going to say, well, let's think about it. How, what do you think he said about that? And then we'll create the story. That's what I want to move on. That's to how it goes on. That's how it I want goes. to move on to stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's kind of fun because that fleshes him out. Ed Fallon of Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, where they all they all went to Brooklyn and prospered, and and had uh, you know went into the uh, construction business. So that'll give his his story a little bit more um, gives a little more meat to it rather than just saying. He didn't go because he was in the funeral, and then they died. Let's talk about it a little bit. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting thing. I have never ventured into anything fictional at all, and I've been reading uh, some biographical work about um, Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, mm -hmm. which started as a lark and has become something very serious and very exciting and very all these things. So I ran across a book where the woman wrote about the life of Mary. Mm -hmm. And the detail that goes into that fiction, that I'm, I'm realizing all my work, all I have to do is remember what happened. Mm -hmm. with, with, when you start adding fiction, then you go into another realm. Oh, sure. Yeah. You are really living with that book now. Yes, yeah, and you want to be. I I think you you want to be able to have the reader think that they're there. Oh, what very you're, what you're yeah. talking about. So that yeah. puts you into yeah. a whole other. Yeah. So then you yeah. have things going around in your head all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I try to, uh, on a very simple level, do that with um, embellishing this genealogy data, where it it you, instead of saying. You know, person A was born on this date and died on that date, and I, I try to put in between those two dates something, something, because there was a, probably a lot that went on, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, it's fiction. It, you want to you want to read more. I think I have family members that don't read; they don't like to read. Oh, I'm sorry. And I think it's because I say. You just haven't met the right book yet. Because once you meet the book that brings you in and you can't get out until you see what happens at the end of the story, then you're then hooked. You're hooked. Yeah. And I just don't think that they have, they have read the have right book. They not, have they not met the right book? Or have they not met the right pair of glasses? Oh, sure, there's always that. Yeah, yeah that's a good, uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. As possible, yeah. Or they just don't sit still long enough to read a book, too. You well, but you yeah, know, yeah. if you don't, if you, you can't, can't see, read, yeah. if you can't see those words properly, it slows you down. I agree. And and you're not going to get sucked in. I agree. I do because you know I have bifocals now, so it is. It's it's hard to. Uh, you're constantly readjusting. You're making sure you're at the right angle so you can see the computer. You can see the. Oh sure, that's a big deal. You know what? What visually you can you can catch up on. And I operate under the theory <clears throat> that if you're using a pair of glasses and you find it difficult, they're the wrong pair of glasses. And I have been known to, upon hearing someone say, "I'm having trouble with these new glasses. I can't." I've been known to go up to them and say, "They're the wrong glasses." Sure, they're the wrong glasses. Yes. That's going to ruin your life. You better go. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> those yeah. glasses. I on. did, I did, uh, I did invest in um, computer glasses that are uh, better for the space that I'm at now because I'm, I really do spend a lot of time reading on uh, on a screen. So they're they're coated with something that's supposed to keep my eyes safe from whatever it is the computers. What? Uh, how often do you sit at that computer? 
Well, way too much. Um, really? Yeah. I, I, I have, you, talk, you talked earlier about the routine. So, uh, you know, the routine is a cup of tea. So this is a big project. I mean, I, I oh, could, yeah. I could this spend... Oh, yeah. This is a lot. There's a lot of editing that has gone on with this. And so I have, because I have problems with sitting too long, every 20 minutes I have to pop up and go and do something else and move so that I'm not stiff and then I'll go back and then I have another so I almost say to you know set a timer and I have to get up and yeah. that could go on for two hours mm -hmm. but it, it would only be an hour if I didn't have to keep getting up and down but that's the way it works that's my writing routine yeah up and down but I can actually will take it and stand this is at a standing uh, phase take it anywhere do you have a standing desk I should but I don't know do you know anyone a counter that, do you have a sta do you know anyone with a standing desk I don't no I don't I know a woman who has a, a, a standing desk and really the only thing that makes it a standing de desk is the, the top is higher mm. and the company that calls it a desk sent her this floor pad <laughs> And she oh, stand stands yeah. on that floor pad, yeah. and the floor pad is very, very interesting, and it does, it does work. You're much more, you're much more alert. Well, the feet are more comfortable too. I think when when you have a when you have a cushion to stand on, um, that makes a difference too. So if your feet are happy, your mm -hmm. legs are happy, and then the rest of you is happy. Well, and and sure. there, the the pad has a lot of valleys and hills, hmm. so that you are constantly moving so that your ankles are exercised and and it does present a whole different way of working mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about doing that well but, I think it's good to look into because I do think that if you're not comfortable you're not your energy is not flowing and your creative energy isn't flowing so if you're if you're you're sitting and you're uncomfortable or if you're standing or you're and you're uncomfortable your mind is then being distracted away from what it is you're trying to do yeah, I think. So, How, do you have writer's block? Do you ever suffer with writer's block? Sure. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I had writer's block with this project for like five years. I just didn't know what to do with it. I literally didn't know what to do with it, and I had to just step away from it and um, accept that when the right time was going to come along, it would, and it did. So. Yeah. And then, bam. Just clear the decks, get out of the way, because we're yeah. gonna make this happen. But sure, and I think that's I think writer's block is not to be afraid of. I mean, or not to be angry with it. I think it's there for a purpose, and it's it's there to be uh, embrace it and say, all right, what is it that you're trying to tell me? Writer's block. Yeah. What is it that? What am I missing? Yeah. You know, or just go away. I, and I've done that, gone away and moved on to other things. Go to another project yeah. and come back. But like yeah. even with this one, I mean, this is a, it's the same thing. I mean, it was a, it was a project that I thought about for a long time. And then I just, it, I think it's like anything. When you get in the groove, you're in the groove. And then you can't get out of it till it's done. And that's cool. That's, that's very right. true. I, I mean, that that's is it. very true. Are you in the groove with your project now? Absolutely. Or you, you, so you just keep going at it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Every moment that, that, I, that I have available to yes. me. Yes. Yeah. So then you're, you're on target to get it I, done. Yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it goes. But if something were to happen, like I was working on this one project and the computer and the copy are both mm. fizzled. So I went to another project to work on for the next few weeks until I can get my equipment. yes yes yeah yeah you well know. you know that speaks to the always back up your data oh yeah always you know, back always up your back data, up data. data yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. always yeah. back up your data I mean I and copy everything at the end of every day yeah until the day comes when all of a sudden you hit you hit and it doesn't. It doesn't go. Yeah. I mean, I was writing during the ice storm that we had, and you know, we've had some thunderstorms. We've had some weather come by, and I actually would I just save it, stop it, turn the computer off, and walk away from it because I said, "This is, you know, not gonna I'm work. not going to have Mother Nature screw up my plants. Here. I'm just going to walk away from it, you know, just and just get out of the way of Mother Nature and let her oh do, let her do what it is that she's got to do." But uh, 
Yeah, it's totally. Yeah, it's, but it's fun. I enjoy it. I, I mean, I don't know what's, you know, like I said, what's going to come next is I'm going to work on fictionalizing people and uh, learn how to market myself a little bit better. I, fi I finally figured out, um, and I'll let you know when I do this, but I think I can put a free website together on Google, so I think I'm going to do that. Oh, that's wonderful. I think I'm going to do Have that. Have you tried to do that with Facebook? No, but I think, I th I, I think I'm going to do that. I mean, I've announced these things on, on social media before, but um, I think I'm going to try a website on Google just for Janine's writings. Yeah. I think I'm going to do that. Uh, yeah. LinkedIn, you can do websites in LinkedIn, do websites in Facebook, huh. and I uh, Google. I didn't know that. Look at that. I learned, I learned that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I have not done those. My yeah. website is freestanding, free but they are. Hmm. And one of the things that I did once, and I have known people to do, is I have actually uh, blogged a book. And that, I, I have actually blogged all of my books. Once so I, you put all of your text in the blog? Absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Once I do, because then once you see it locked off into mm -hmm. uh, a chapter, mm -hmm. then you really see it differently, hmm. in a very different way. And, and I learned that early on, and it really helped. It really helped. I never lot. thought of that. I mean, I have a blog that I don't pay too much attention to. It's a uh, view from my kitchen window, hyphen Janine dot blogspot dot com. Wow. So I've had that for God, probably more than 10 years, but I've just lost. I'm doing, you know, writing so many other different places on social media that I've kind of lost track of that a little bit. So I have to go back and revisit that a little bit. Yeah, I have. I I, there's a woman by the name of Anita Amir, A-M-I-R. A-M-I-R is her last name, and she has built a career around blogging a book, teaching people how to do it. And she has a blog that she writes that you could, that you could read, huh. and uh, it's, it's been very, very helpful. Have you taken any writing courses? Is this something that you just developed on your own? Well, I did develop it on my own, uh, wow. and I did. T I've taken uh, a, a few writing courses, and the most recent one before I got going with uh, this memoir of my dad's with uh, Violet Snow. So I like her. She's in the ancestor uh, genre, so it's the same kind of neighborhood that I hang out in, and it was very helpful. Yes. Very, it was helpful. I, I've done different writing courses. I've done the town writing courses that we had pre-pandemic, uh, where you know somebody would come in and you you know get a writing group together and people would write and you'd share back and forth. And I think the more that you do of that, it's good because you kind of get to look at things that people will give you critiques. It's good to get those critiques. Oh, I think you know, writing groups are it's wonderful. It's good to do that. So I've done that. If you can be, yeah. if you're in the right one. You know? Yeah, that's true. You gotta. Yeah, sometimes it's not the chemistry has to be right. It's kind of like going to an AA meeting. You know, if the chemistry is not right, you go somewhere else. You know. So, well, and yeah. also not only that, it's got to be the right. It, the people have to be together. But also, if you're writing a memoir hmm. and everybody in your group is writing sure. science fiction or something. Well, I it's, was in a group like that, but I, it worked for me because it gave me an opportunity to expand what my line of thinking was. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I mean, I was just, I was cool with just writing essays. You know, they'd give you a topic and you have to run out an essay about the topic or something like that, which is fine. But there were other people that were writing some serious uh, um, fiction, and it was good. I mean, maybe that's what gave me the idea that maybe someday I would try it, try fiction. I don't know. But uh, I mean, there's certain things. I mean, dialogue is has a whole nother uh, oh. way of running into dialogue. Uh, there's dialogue in, in this project, and it damn near drive me crazy. But um, you know, that's a, a, that's another form of writing and having to pay attention to detail and, and things like that. Dialogue, and uh, yeah, but it's good. I mean, it's. I think it's. I'm happy with doing it. So. I took uh, some classes under a woman in uh, Albany, uh, in Troy, under a woman by the name of Marion Roach Smith. Hmm. And her husband is um, the editor of the, the paper in Albany. Hmm. And um, I learned a lot about dialogue writing from her. 
and I could never, I could never have done any of it without some kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. And I took some dialogue classes at Gotham as well. And dialogue is not my strong suit. Yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, you have to. It's a lot to think about when you do dialogue. Right. I didn't realize that, but I, you know, it does require a certain concentration, and the storyline has to be a certain way. So, this right now, for now, this is good to. To, to keep doing what I'm doing and uh, well I think and, memoirs that's what I ended up studying at Gotham mm. and I ended up writing my first book as memoir mm. because that was the one that was easiest for me to learn mm -hmm. and I and I love the I love it and I love reading memoir Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was the one thing I wanted to make sure that I, I did say uh, is that it doesn't have to be a book. It can be a, a paragraph, Yes, a memoir. I mean, I would encourage everybody to write down a few things about your past or what you did or what you think is important or what you want people to remember or what you want to remember. It's just such a treasure to be able to look at things. I mean, I have pages and pages of stuff that my mom wrote and it's a treasure to be able to look at her handwriting and look at the perspective that she took about things. But she just did it like 10 lines at a time, basically. And before you know it, she filled up a whole book. She journaled. So you she say journaled. she journaled. Yes, she journaled. And I think that's a good way to start. But don't even, that can be even intimidating to some people. Just take, you know, Dad, Dad started on a three by five card. Little, you know, white three by five cards. He'd write down his thoughts right there. It was an outline, and that's basically what he did. And he, and he built a whole story out of it. So it's really kind of important to be able to treasure those things that we have in our heads that, we, that are memorable for not only town, like, the, you know, put the historical society hat on there a little bit. I mean, that's how we get a lot of our information when we write history stories or history books is little bits and pieces of stuff that people wrote down in different places. You know, um, at Barnes & Noble, and I'm sure at other bookstores as well, in the journal department, you can find books that, will, that would be, uh, like, essentially, the books are writing prompts, and it would hmm. be uh, writing this, I'm writing this for my granddaughter, and mm -hmm. this is a grandmother's book, or a, yeah, yeah. a young one, you yeah. know, so you can, yeah. if you feel intimidated with, by the idea of writing something, you can buy one of these books for not very much money, and almost just fill just in the blanks, the right, yes, and yes, that will yes, give you yes. a start. Absolutely, that's a great point to bring up, yes, yes, those, those are great tools, whoever, you know, I mean, obviously everybody's thinking about the same idea, so somebody developed that, that that's a tool, and I think that's a great idea, you know, to have somebody just pick that up. I mean, you, what happens is you give those things as a gift to your, your grandmother, or your, and then they look at that and they go, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know that's what happens, but, but you don't have to do that. Just sit down with a piece of, just sit down with it, it's just a little thing, and just take it one question at a time, <laughs> and don't be overwhelmed with it. Yeah, I, whenever I start anything new, I've got to have a teacher. I have to have somebody that just kind of says, oh, that's good. Oh, maybe you should. And other people oh, God, just go yeah. marching forward yeah. without any. Yeah. And I'm not, once I get a hang of things, but in the beginning, I really do need somebody to coddle me along. Well, there's nothing wrong with having a guide. And I, you know, I'm always available to guide people on any of these projects. And I wanted to be able to say that, too. So, I mean, I don't mind you know, just chatting it up with people about something if they have an idea, because really the idea takes off on its own. If it really wants, That's if true. the story wants to get told and if the piece wants to be written, it it's won't let go. you sleep until you've done it. So, that's you know, true. that's I think that's another uh, aspect of it, uh, at least this kind of stuff. And I think fiction's the same way, probably. Um, but definitely, uh, yeah, I'm available if anybody wants to brainstorm. Now, do you belong to the Woodstock Historical Society? I do. The Historical Society, yes. If a person is just there for a long time. can they just show up? What do you mean by interested? I, I don't know. If somebody's curious, a new, a new resident, if they're well, curious about it. So basically we're going to open up our season here uh, in the end of April. Uh, I would go to the Historical Society website, historical, historicalsocietyofwoodstock.org, 
and follow the website and there will be announcements as to when it's going to be open. It's usually open on weekends in the season when there's a show. If you want to be, uh, that you can have an appointment and, and one of us will meet you there, but that you would just follow the email that's on the website and you know, or make a phone call. There's the phone number there and we'll figure it out. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So it is open to the public. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we have, uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to give a number, and of course I'll hear about it if I give it wrong. But I think there's seventy thousand pieces of local history uh, in our archive. I think that's a number. That's a good number, and it's all there. It's Woodstock's archive, and it's for people to look at. And you just need to make an appointment because, you know, we're not we're all volunteers. So. And yeah. what kind of things do you keep? Well, so, you know, Richard Hepner, our town historian, is putting together a permanent uh, Woodstock exhibit that will open up this summer. And one of the things that we have are um, a down rent horn that he's going to have on the permanent exhibit. And there's also uh, items that were made at the Shady Glass Factories, and that's the uh, early 1800s, that, that level. We've got, uh, we have the Bicentennial Quilt. Remember that when we did that? 19, 1987. We did a bicentennial quilt. We've got maps. We have 700 pieces of art by Woodstock artists done in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So wow. 700 pieces of art. So we're the stewards of uh, a, a number of different um, pieces of Woodstock history. We're going to have a tool shed that's going to be launched this year. So that will be a permanent exhibit. It's, it's, in a, it's another building that we have, and that will be our first mo real modern exhibit, if you will. <laughs> We're coming out of the Stone Age, so to speak. Uh, but it will be an example of the tools that were used in the different industries. In